Hi little axolotls, welcome back to another video or if you are new here, welcome to the tank. I'm very blurry at the moment but my name is Ezra because that is my name as the whole person that I am. I just happen to be an individual with dissociative identity disorder. As you can probably tell from the title of this video is today we are going to be talking about white fragility. We're going to be, you know, dissecting what white fragility is and how, I guess, the examples of it in society but also the examples of it that we obviously see in the dissociative community because you know me, I like to make everything about race. Not really, but it's probably one of the, is the most racist community that I have uh, ever dealt with. So of course I'm going to be addressing that and a lot of my content is about that. But white people in general, I do tend to have an issue with, I'd say at least 90% of the time. But let's get into that and I feel like these comments are also going to prove me right depending on the audience that this hits. But let's jump into things. The term white fragility was coined in 2011 by Robin D'Angelo. Now it is defined as a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear and guilt, and behaviours such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. These behaviours in turn function to reinstate white racial equilibrium. I'd note there as well, along with that definition, Robin D'Angelo has actually written a book called White Fragility. I would say that I would recommend it because I probably would, except for I have yet to read the whole thing. I'm currently listening to it as an audiobook, but I would highly recommend, especially if you are a white person watching or listening to this video, that you go give that a read. As to places where we see white fragility, honestly, we will see it everywhere in which a discussion about race is had. The best example that I can think of recently in, in society in general where a lot of people have weighed in on this topic would be obviously the slap in which, you know, the, the Oscar situation with you know, um, Will Smith slapping Chris Rock um, and more, more so obviously the joke itself and the impact of that on Jada Smith and how a lot of white people commenting on the whole situation as to whether Will should or shouldn't have, you know, slapped Chris Rock and just analysing that it's, oh, just a joke and alopecia when really it has a lot more weight to it and cultural history behind the symbolism and the value of black women's hair and that there is a lot culturally culturally behind that and when black people have tried to call that out white people have become very defensive about it and it's typically like white fragility is typically a situation where there is a lot of defensiveness but also that the situation is turned back around to which a point where the white person is then the victim that the black person that is pointing out racism is you know perpetuating violence towards them or that they're attacking them and that the black person is the aggressor for trying to get the white person to see the issue that is racism in front of them whether they are directly involved or whether they are a passive party to the racial inequality with that being said though defensiveness isn't just in regards to being aggressive or saying oh you're hating on me or anything like that you know and, and the obvious things of like minimizing black issues or POC issues but it also includes things like virtue signaling now virtue signaling is essentially again a good example I can think of this um, for this would be during the Black Lives Matter um, movement and uh, the processing and George Floyd where there was that um, day where people were posting a just like a black square on Instagram virtual sign signaling is essentially something that you know proves that you are woke and supporting the cause but you're not actually actively doing anything to help it's essentially like performative activism right and it's that thing 
I guess it's that thing of making an example that I'm being supportive of this cause and it kind of ties in as well to the, the sayings that a lot of people will use when you try and bring up racism, like white people will say, oh, well, I don't see colour or there's only one race that is the human race, kind of as a means to sidestep the issue, whether it is something that they realise that they are doing or not, but as a means to derail the conversation as to not feel guilty for being a part of society that is driven off the back of white supremacy and you know still to this day there is like a there's a global amount of racial inequality for those who are people of color and obviously being able to derail, derail that conversation means that they are able to no longer I guess be part of that problem with that being said you also see that in that distancing that white people will do where if you see a you know if you if there's a white shooter that has killed like black people for example and white people will say oh you know that that person is a monster or that distancing from that that communal aspect of one of us kind of thing being like oh that person is a monster and taking away from they're part of my community they're part of my race much like we see in discussions about you know the the like not all men right much like we see in those discussions it's like you know obviously femme presenting people or, or women um i used to identify as obviously when i um you know lived my 19 20 years as a, as a girl kind of thing but Obviously, we're not saying every single man, but we're saying it's enough men, it's majority of men to the point where we don't feel safe on the streets, where we don't feel safe going on dates or leaving our drinks. It doesn't literally mean not all men, but it is a thing to manipulate, minimize and completely derail the conversation in order to not feel guilty or not feel associated with that same group of people. A big part of white fragility that we will see within media and I will put you know some clips up here but is white woman tears. What I mean by white women tears is that there is there is a large amount of power that white women hold through their emotion in able to again same kind of idea right is to manipulate the situation and turn it on its head because white women are, you know, white women and white femme presenting people, right, they can be seen as being very feeble, very innocent, that they could, that they couldn't do any wrong. And because of that, it's so easy for them to get their way or to cry their way out of situations and use that emotion to gain help under false pretenses. I know that there was a video a while back, because this is just what's coming to my head, of a black person was walking their dog or something like that and a white woman was in hysterics of this person being in the area or her dog was attacked there was, there was something you, you probably know the video that I'm talking about but in these situations right is that the white woman will for example like with this video is like you know call the police or make this huge deal over something be very outwardly racist about a situation but try and like in the examples of call the police for example um, act as if she's the victim in the situation or act as though this person was the one who initiated this um, the aggression or this argument kind of thing and there are also examples of this on talk shows or on the news where a black person will try and bring up the issue of racism and how white people play into that and the white woman will then take that as an attack because again there's that element of being the damsel in, the, in distress that they're so innocent and that that they're being made out to be this horrible person and that someone needs to defend them or someone needs to see the fact that this person is being aggressive towards them and like within all of that and, and part of I guess those white women tears and within that white fragility is something that why I wanted to make this video is it is very evident within the disability community as well that that aspect of white fragility because you see and I'm not just talking about specifically in the dissociative community though we will get back to that 
but you see in advocacy that there is very and to start off with there's very little representation of for people of color right because when you typically see disability being represented it is typically a white person so there is very little representation for people of color let alone you know black people in these portrayals of what you know disability is like and there needs to be that recognition that of, of black people having disability um, in general but that there is a very big difference of how black people with disabilities are treated in comparison to their white counterparts and this is something that is obviously brought up within the disability community but there is a lot of white fragility that is tied to that and there has been a movement since 2016 um, that is called you know disability like the hashtag is disability to white right and this is something that was started on Twitter basically with this hashtag is that it was utilized to decenter um, to decenter whiteness by sharing moments of lived experience um, and illustrating the structural oppressions um, that are stemming from the intersections of disability, gender, race, and class. One of the things that was shared under the hashtag disability to white um, is when it's assumed that black parents of disabled kids can't raise them. Another thing is that when black autistic people go underdiagnosed and labeled as behavior problems, this in itself with the whole like behavior problems, right? It is very um, evident like with how society seems to treat and think of black people as being quite aggressive. And you think of the idea, you know, that stereotype of the angry black woman, but in general, black people are seen as, you know, being aggressive, that we are very masculine that we are you know feral savages like that kind of idea stemming from you know colonization and when you know white people came and like took everyone's land right is there's that thing of you know savagery that we are less than that we are a danger to you know white society like maybe I'm reading too much into that one, but that's kind of the idea that comes up or the thoughts that come up when it's like behavior problems, whether it is a, you know, black kid being underdiagnosed versus their white counterpart who is diagnosed. Now, what you see with these, like within, within the conversation that was had with this hashtag and just in general things that you see is that white people become and again in this example disabled white people become very infuriated at the idea that they're less oppressed so to speak than black people with disability that they can't be that everything is very black and white pardon the pun but that there's this idea that there isn't any nuance involved in oppression and that there is one way to be disabled so to speak so some of the things that came up within you know this hashtag initially starting one of the comments was good morning world how can we hate white people today i know let's turn disability into a race issue another person says what privilege do i have in being white i didn't choose that any more than i chose being wheelchair bound and someone else has said did twitter really just turn disability into a race issue how pathetic but funnily enough with those comments and this is kind of what was said within this and i'm sure it's very reiterated um, by people of color but when you see responses by white people by white disabled people like that it further exemplifies the issue that is being had it further shows that well clearly you know there is this element of white fragility that that disability is clearly too white that people are not wanting to acknowledge that they still have some type of power even if they are disabled it's that failure to recognize that there is an intersection between um and there is a comparison i guess between how those who are disabled and white are treated versus those who are disabled and black are treated much like if you were to look at the intersection of those who are disabled and male versus those who are disabled and female or those who are disabled and cis and those who are disabled and trans there's obviously always going to be some sort of power dynamic kind of thing like there's always going to be some kind of who is more oppressed because that is that is where we are at in society nowadays like you know we can't play a game of oh but we're all one race we're all the human a human race and completely ignore 
the racism, the sexism, the ableism, the, you know, um, homophobia, transphobia, like we can't ignore that that exists in society and pretend to be like, we're all one human race and we all get along because that's not the reality of the world at the moment, right? Like something I wish that I could find when I was going through all of this research, I guess, though, other than th these conversations from, from Twitter and Twitter users is that I wanted to find some sort of video footage of this white fragility, but it was very hard to do because, I mean, A, I think it's just because there is a lot of it and a lot of it goes unnoticed or again because there is that that implicit bias and there is such a large large quantity of people being represent like the representation is so white when it comes to disability advocacy is that it is so normalized and black people often feel afraid to bring it up because again there is that response from white people that they will turn it into manipulation, that they will make everything about them and will continue like to fail to recognize that one, this isn't about them and that they are part of the, the problem. And I think a lot of that as well is obviously because when you have things like the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd and the picture of, you know, the black square on Instagram and people that go on things like mission trips to help the starving kids in Africa, people will use that to say, well, I'm not racist because I clearly do this thing or I'm not racist because I don't say the N-word when there's so much more to racism than just using that word and funnily enough I actually had a comment um, on my because I'm recording this like a day after getting that comment but I had a comment on my video uh, that I did talking about dissociated and the um, and the usage of the the n-word um, and doja cat and the lip syncing and someone you can see it below but I'll put screenshots in here but basically someone who from what I have gathered is a person of color but isn't black not sure as to their ethnicity, but they're being very cryptic about it. But this person saying that black people need to choose whether, pretty much whether everyone can say the word or no one can say the word, that we can't have it both ways and that black people can't just be able to say the word and then not allow other other races to say it, which obviously is something that annoyed me, which you can probably see here. And not necessarily that that is a example of white fragility because again I'm not sure as to this person's race but they said that they've experienced racism but they also haven't said that they're you know black however I think that that is somewhat an example of turning it on its head making me as if I am the bad person that I'm gatekeeping essentially a word that everyone should be able to say or no one should be able to say it that it is wrong for me or it's not proper advocacy for me to call out that racism and to enforce the fact that some people shouldn't be able to say that word and that there is still that racism and racial connotations that are attached to that word by people who are still treated as superior in society and that's not okay for them to be able to say things like that. But back to what I was saying before, yeah, with with disability advocacy or any type of advocacy that you see, there is this idea that white advocates doing all of these things somehow makes them not racist, even though it's kind of like they expect a reward for doing the bare minimum, that by doing X, Y, Z, that, that therefore means that they're not racist, that they're a stand-up citizen, that they are a complete ally to people of colour, which is a total load of bullshit. And I'm trying as well, um, like I'm trying within this video to be very tame somewhat, to explain these things without emotions, to be somewhat bland, because when I say things in the way that I want to say them, it is taken as an attack. There is the idea that black people need to be so calm and level-headed when trying to get this point across, even when situations do escalate, but there is the idea that we have to be calm as to not be seen as aggressive, as to not be seen as the problem, that we need to make things more palatable to white people in order for them to understand it when, 
you know, 90% of the time they're still going to, it's going to go over their heads and they are going to turn that situation into an us problem, that they, we are the problem, not them being the common denominator, you know, throughout society, throughout history. With all of that being said, though, it is unfortunate, though, that it was so difficult for me to try and find specific examples of white people, like white disability advocates, doing these things of this white fragility because and, and you can't say that oh that's because it doesn't happen no it's it's because it is so normalized and if you're trying to google for example um racist disability advocates that things like that aren't going to ping on google because it's just going to come up about anti-racist advocates right but a lot of what i look into with this Obviously, it always it, it's very it's very easy to find within the, the dissociative community, right? It, it's so easy to find because this whole notion around alters and I swear I could make so many videos about how racist the community is because you guys make it way too fucking easy. Like it's not even like it's like you're not even trying to hide how racist you are anymore at all. However, however, you see this a lot in the whole debate over race claiming. Obviously, you'll see it the most there, but you've got it as well with that stereotyping, with that race claiming, right, of the lack of, you know, system responsibility, right? So someone will claim to have a black altar and the black altar will write things they'll either contain slurs or it will be very stereotyping kind of um ghetto words right and then the you know the host or another altar in the system that that sees themselves as that that is white much like the body is white that as a whole that they are white they will come on and write an apology because they've faced some sort of backlash they'll be like oh, so-and-so did this, and it'll be a very, like, half-assed apology, like, um, it didn't mean to cause offence, or it just won't be genuine at all. I would just like to say that I get a lot of comments every week calling me either racist or a bully or a transphobe or this, this, and that because of mostly Alice who leaves comments on other people's video and she's a bitch she doesn't get the backlash I get the backlash and then I have to block people and then delete comments and then delete c c the comments that Alice put and I have been crying and angry and freaking out all day because this happens like every freaking day uh, so I'm gonna take accountability because they did it with my body so yes it does deserve to be lashed at me but mostly them I just I hate this and Having altars is very sucky sometimes. Very disingenuous. Or there will be people that are commenting on these kinds of videos. I will see it where a black person, whether they have DID or OSDD or they are just dissociative or if they are just a black person and they don't even have the disorder because in a matter like this, yes, black people still do have an opinion, like maybe that's an unpopular opinion I have, but even if a black person doesn't have DID, if you are trying to bring race claiming into this, of course that black person deserves to have an opinion within that scope of things. Because if you're trying to claim race things, of course the person that's that race deserves to have an input. But I have seen where a black person will bring up, hey, you know, this makes me uncomfortable and then there are these users in the comments that will be like oh you know well that's a you problem or then too bad or you're being you know you're being too precious about it all of these things and I sit there and I'm like I'm sorry what it's just very evident that there is just complete disregard and minimizing minimizing issues and if I were to circle that back, Dissociated, who is the biggest creator, like the most popular creator on the platform, the issue that I had the other day, which I addressed with the Doja Cat song, which there has been an apology, apology uh, since, 
you know, and those two videos have been taken down. But to discuss that a little bit and just dissect a little bit in terms of white fragility when it comes to that video, I can include the video in here because it's owned by TikTok, like it's, it's within the terms and conditions. I checked all of this. Please don't sue me. Um, So, to read to you what the actual lyrics are, I'm not your mummy nigger, find a new hobby nigger, return your fork, it picked up your shits in the lobby nigger, I'm not gonna key your car, I'll call your fucking mum. See how there's like a big difference, like when you close your mouth at the end of a word before you start a new phrase, like, let me, let me just, I'm not your mummy, find a new hobby, return your fog, it picked up your shits in the lobby, I'm not gonna key your car, I'm not your mummy nigga, find a new hobby nigga, return your fog, it picked up your shits in the lobby nigga, I'm not gonna key your car, and call your fucking mom. After playing that a billion times and having to record that because I keep on forgetting the lyrics, um, it's... <laughs> but apparently it was ambiguous. And I think, I mean, I have a problem with, um... Sorry, I don't remember what this video was about. Um, one, this is about white fragility, right? So that video was posted, the, the first video, right? And then the second video that was posted says that people are reaching and essentially that, you know, haters this, haters that. Just watch the video. Okay, I know some people really have it out for us, but this is reaching. This hasn't even been up for five minutes and people are saying that we said the word. So I'm going to lip sync it, but say it out loud so you can see that's just the way my mouth moves when I'm not saying the word. It's not that hard. I'm not your mummy. Find a new hobby. Something, something, something. Your shit's in the lobby. I'm not going to key your car. See? Stop reaching. It's getting embarrassing. Seriously. Like, no, no one is reaching. This isn't reaching. People aren't having it out for you. You're being racist. And that, again, that white fragility of being like, I'm the damsel in distress. People are hating on me because they're calling this thing out. No acknowledgement of, oh, okay, what I've done is, is problematic. There's none of that. It's just that people, people are reaching. I'm sorry, but the mouth, the, the mouth movements are different maybe maybe i'm just reaching but the mouth movements are ever so slightly different maybe it's because i did do linguistics for a little bit um but the jaw shape the the, the this bit here it's it's different and that bit at the end of just being like see stop reaching see what i mean though it is just like that condescending tone of an like again this isn't just i'm not just saying it's them in the dissociative community i'm not just saying it's them in general i'm saying this is a very white person thing right because white fragility it's not called dissociated fragility or chi and co-fragility right but it's that thing of doubling down on what i said wasn't problematic or what i did if i didn't say this thing right um isn't problematic it's that doubling down on the fact that black people are just you know, they're, they're, they're making this up or they're making this to be too big of a deal when it isn't a big deal because what happened didn't happen. It's just like this condescending kind of tone. It's like the, the minimizing, the minimization of the issue, white woman tears, all of that, right? Now, mind you, when this video was taken down, which I think was during maybe when I was uploading my video or not long after I uploaded my reaction video, because then when I had a comment on my video saying the video has been taken down, I'm like, OK, chill. That I wasn't aware of that when I uploaded it, but still that doesn't take away my right to comment on a public video that is publicly racist. 
Hey guys, just a thing for clarification. So we did a uh, voiceover thing joining in on the trend where people sing the really catchy Doja, Doja Cat song. Um, we didn't say the word and I thought that we made that really clear. We were trying to be very careful. We left our mouth very much unmoving and like that open so you could see that we weren't going. I thought that we made that really clear we were trying to be very careful we left our mouth very much unmoving and like that like that open so you could see that we weren't going to make the hard n um we were very careful about it but the issue isn't our intention it's the effect that it could have the vast majority of people said it didn't look like we said it, but we did have a couple of people who said um, that it did look am ambiguous. So we made a video proving by um, matching our lips, but saying it out loud that that's not what we said. But regardless, some people are still saying it looked ambiguous. So just to make sure that, you know, nobody's offended and stuff, we're going to take them both down just to be safe. We didn't say the word and we thought that we made that really clear and then obviously on the screen big point here we don't use slurs don't support anyone using that slur and never will now that bit there is an example of what i was talking about earlier of like we don't use slurs don't support anyone using it and never will that is that example kind of of that virtue signaling that i don't do any of this and i don't support this so therefore i'm not part of the problem is in the problem that is racism right it's that putting you as an ally that putting yourself as a good guy that you're one of you know the good white people and that the, the drawing that line of like there's good white people and then there's bad white people it's like there's the kkk and then there's every other white person i also like that bit there because that is a blatant lie um left our mouth unmoving and very much like that so you couldn't sit their mouth was closed which you can see from the first video and the second video where they were trying to double down on the fact that everyone was reaching and that they didn't say the word so maybe it's because they deleted the two video like benefit of the doubt maybe it's because they deleted the two videos and they no longer had the you know video of them like the recording of them saying it i don't know but their mouth wasn't open i also don't like the ending of that of being like just to make sure nobody is offended we're going to take them down because one, it's not an actual apology, and two, again, it's that thing of I'm going to take this down because I'm a good person and I don't want people to be offended by it, right? Then you see the comments as well um, from the most recent video of someone saying, and this is the pinned comment, right? And this is a white person saying, I think it was very clear that you didn't use the slur, but it's always good to listen to black people's voices when they express uncomfort and you know Kaya's written that's our opinion too then someone's like this is how creators should act when this kind of accusation is made you know you didn't say it and yet you took both videos down love y'all um there were quite a couple of comments like this and they were 98 percent by white people uh, so there's the idea that they didn't say it and by them taking it down that white people seem to be able to accept that apology even though that, that that apology isn't meant for them but then also it puts them as oh they've done this great thing by taking down these videos even though the second one was very minimizing of black issues of those who brought it up and and it's yeah it's very white knight white savior complex white fragility thing to do it's funny as well because i'm when i'm talking about this i just feel starting to disconnect because it's been i've been filming this for like over an hour um the video in its entirety it's probably going to be less of it it's probably going to be like a 20 minute video lol but yeah it's 
racial trauma is triggering racial trauma is real trauma i'm i'm working on a, a side project actually like to completely derail from all of that to give me a bit of a brain break i'm working on a separate project um again about racism in the did community and hopefully i'll be filming that within the next couple of days i don't know i have some more videos on in my backlog for my channel so see how that goes but yeah i didn't plan on this video going uh, i mean i kind of that that was kind of the example that when i wanted to make a video about white fragility which i've had in my planner for a while but because that incident kind of happened in between there that was the first thing that i thought of and i was like i'm gonna address this in there right but yeah it's the amount of turning it against black people the amount of white people in the comments turning it against black people and reinforcing and enabling that racism or that ability to either get away with racism or to get away with minimizing the concerns of black people yeah it's just i've been filming this video for a while and i'm trying to film this so i don't hate it and have to refilm this again but if the biggest creator on the like the most well-known creator on youtube right that so many people will be like referring others to when they want to learn about the disorder if this person is being enabled to continue those behaviors and also for their followers to consume that content and think oh you know this is okay or this is the reaction that i should have should this happen to me again instills that that aspect of white fragility instills the continual racism that is happening within the dissociative community but also within the mental health online community everything that is bigger than that as well that i haven't necessarily touched on in this video that i'll probably touch on in another video but talking about how racism is very prevalent within the medical field like as in within whether it be mental health whether it be physical health like the the access that black people have to health is very different to their white counterparts and i'm not saying that you know there isn't that dis um and i'm not saying that there isn't that intersection of disability or of class and those kinds of privileges right but i'm saying that when we talk about it from a race perspective there is that inequality and that is certainly something that i want to make a, a video about and i want to try and make more australian based content it's just unfortunately a lot of the stuff that i can find is literally about the united states and i'm uh, so thank you for watching my video about white fragility i might do a follow-up video that isn't in relation to like if i can find more more evidence and sources um not necessarily dissociated related i mean mental health community in general right um disability community um advocates and and racism if i can find more of that or if you have more of that 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 you can you know link me or something i would be very appreciative of that um of examples of disability advocates that are white you know that have had instances of white fragility in the past certainly i, w I would love that but I might make a video, might not. We'll see how it goes. I hope that this video has been somewhat informative and can also show examples of uh, white fragility within the you know, disability advocacy, online mental health community, whatever. I'm going to go now, but thanks for watching. Keep swimming a little axolotls and always remember to be authentic, be accountable and be inclusive. And we will see you for the next video. Bye.